Everyone was sitting on pins and needles, waiting with 100% confidence that the Rebbe is going to get up from before uh, uh, Chavzayin Adar and after Chavzayin Adar. And afterwards, that the Rebbe was going to get up and give the gala, that he is the King Mashiach that we've been waiting for for thousands of years and march us into Eretz Yisrael with Beis HaMikdash and the whole thing. Lamata Masar Trachim and like whatever else we say every Shabbos after a, a good vote. <laughs> yeah, and everybody was just like, you know, saying, it's like, oh, this is it, this is it, you know, the Rebbe is Magal. I mean, that's, we lived on, that's how it was, you know. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to Greeting Mashiach. Today, we have a very, very special interview. We have uh, two very, very special people. Um, we have David Feldman and Mil- Miriam Rachel Feldman. Um, David is a licensed marriage and family counselor, and um, Miriam is uh, a lot of things, a marriage coach, anxiety and trauma specialist, but uh, one thing that we know her for is her very special book that she wrote, God Said What?, um, hashtag my orthodox life and um, I suggest everybody to either at the end of this interview well, listening to this interview or at any time that you have to go g- pick up the book pause this interview read the book and come back <laughs> and then come back correct <laughs> uh, there you go all right so um so we'll just I guess jump right in and um, I guess if whoever want, wh- whichever one of you want to start if I guess go through a little background of your life, you know, for those people that didn't read the book. Yeah, yeah, I'll start first, just because I was the first one to be introduced to, you know, Orthodox Judaism. Uh, our path actually, we met in college before we became observant in the cornfields of Iowa, and um, that's where Meryl and I became friends, and we were living more of a liberal lifestyle at the time. Eventually, I made my way to Eretz Yisrael. My sister was getting engaged there, and uh, I was one of those uh, Rabbi Schusterman, you know, um, Rabbi Mayor Schuster. He, the song that Mordechai Ben David made popular about the backpacker standing at the hotel and somebody knocks on your shoulders and asks if you want to come for Shabbos. I was one of those uh, kids at the time, and Not I got dragged. Serendipity. <laughs> <laughs> I got I got uh, dragged off to Me'asharim for my first you know traditional Orthodox Shabbos Hasidic Shabbos, and uh, I made my way to Eishat Torah, and then I invited my wife to come uh, visit me there. And you've, you've you two have read the book, so you so you know the story. Uh, but I, I I started off more in the Litvish, more uh, Orthodox, you know, derech that way, and um, only got introduced to Chabad after. My wife and I decided that it was time for us to try again. (laughs) To date date again. To date date again. (laughs) Uh, And as you know, it was a very interesting and turbulent experience for both of us. (laughs) But thank God it worked out. And now we're marriage therapists and coaches. There you go. (laughs) Says a lot. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, so my journey was a little, was very different, obviously. Um, so I grew up, you know, secular Jewish and kind of rejected the religion. I always studied the Holocaust and and that kind of thing, but I didn't, I didn't believe in religion and, um, and Judaism just was, you know, what I knew of it. I just, it didn't, didn't appeal to me. So even when people would ask me, are you Jewish, you know, or what are you? I would never even say I was Jewish, you know? Um, And so I was living in Berkeley, California, and David and I had, I had already graduated. He had been traveling abroad and we went our own separate ways, but, but, you know, there would be letters every once in a while. And then there, then all the letters stopped and, um, and I had no idea what happened to him. And I was about to go to Guatemala to like help save refugees. And I was living my nice, you know, Berkeley life there. And I received this 13 page letter. And in the letter, he was saying he was doing these things in Israel. Somehow he landed up in Israel instead of being in Europe, where I thought he was. And he's, you know, eating a certain diet and he's wearing white strings. And I I knew nothing, you know, nothing. And I was just like, what is he doing? But he said something about I should, you know, come to Israel and I should check out what he's doing. So I literally looked up rabbi in the Berkeley Yellow Pages and 
um, and went to see a rabbi there. And uh, the rabbi looked at the you know return address, Asha Torah, and he read the letter a little book, but and then he's just like he's in a cult, and you you got to go get him out. And I said, well, I'm supposed to leave for Guatemala. I don't I don't want to go to Israel. And he said, well, you know that'll be it. If you don't get him out, you'll just you know he'll be gone. So that was very frightening. And so I made the decision to you know get. I actually spoke to him on the phone, and he really sounded far gone. I could not understand like what he was talking about, miracle, God, all these things. And I really thought like this is it. They got him. So I got a whole bunch of feminist you know Jewish books. And I hopped on a plane and he wouldn't pick me up at the airport because I must have landed on Chavez. And I go to the old city and um, I met more people that like God just sets things up in very, you know, uh, incredible ways. So I keep meeting people who all talk about, yeah, I was here last year. And now look at me now, you know, got married and we, you know, with hair coverings and yarmulkes and miracles. And I was like, oh, my gosh, everybody here is a nutcase. <laughs> and <laughs> It was terrifying. And then I saw him and he wouldn't even give me a hug and I'd come all this way. And so, uh, yeah, and that started the journey and he wanted me to learn there. We really did argue through the streets of, you know, the old city and people did tell us to like be quiet. But I was like, I was, I was really frightened. I was like, I got to get this guy out of the cult that the rabbi said he was in, you know, and he sounded, and and I, I grew up right next to Muncie. I grew up in New York next to Muncie, but it was like, I never met any Muncie people. I never met any Orthodox Jews. So I never even heard of some of the stuff he was talking about. So my journey was very different. His mother's Israeli and he had gone to Solomon Schechter. So he was familiar with a lot of things. I never saw to fill in. I never knew of this. So it was just kind of a shocking, you know, way to, you know, kind of dive into observant Judaism. And I was much slower and much more resistant. And I thought I'd proved something to all the rabbis and rabbitsons there something they never thought of <laughs> yeah they were all like cool and they friendly. never heard any of these arguments <laughs> yeah, i thought i knew better then his father came and even his father was excited about what he was learning and i was just <laughs> like oh my gosh so again my father and rabbi cutler became really good friends <laughs> Yeah. So like my journey was just like I he he eventually left because he had to finish college. I stayed to learn a little bit more. And there were some things that appealed to me, as you saw in the book. Um, but I just couldn't get into this. I couldn't understand God. I couldn't, you know, I just the codes, there was, didn't do the codes went right over my head. You know, Isha Torah talks about codes and it's in the Torah. And the, I just like it was everything kept going over my head, basically. And so there were a few things that were just kind of like, okay, this is a very interesting perspective. Maybe there's truth here, you know? And, but I went back to, to Berkeley and then I started to kind of explore, you know, Judaism that way, but like more, I was kind of living between two worlds, you know, I'd go out to clubs sometimes Friday nights, but then other nights I'd spend Shabbos with Chabad there. And I started to learn. And then someone said to me, you know, if you really want to learn, you should go to Minnesota. So I went to Rabbi Friedman and Beis Khan in Minnesota. And that was like the perfect place. I actually packed my car up and drove there. And I would just ask all the questions. And he was excellent at, you know, not just answering them, but a whole different perspective on things. Like, you have a Jewish soul. This is who you are. Like, and then I just realized, you know, wow, it's who I am. So no matter what I do, it's just always there. And somehow that just really struck home. A lot of truths kind of, you know, struck home. And then I went to Crown Heights and then I wrote to him in Israel. I said, look, I'm doing this too. And, you know, now we can get married. Everything's good. And then I don't hear from him. I don't hear from him. And then he's like, no, I don't know if this is going to work. And I'm learning. (laughs) And then it was kind of like, but, you know, like, it's like God with the carrot on the stick and then drops the carrot. And then I get to make a decision, like, who am I doing this for? And I felt like, you know, I had learned enough and it was meaningful enough to me and truthful enough to me that I just couldn't go back to, you know, the way I was living and thinking before. So I just plodded on and uh, kept learning. And then I was swept up in Crown Heights with the whole, you know, Rebbe and Mashiach fervor that was happening. And that's, you know, that was my path. And so then, yeah. And yep. This the so story. just to give some, some reference point here, this whole story started and ended in what year approximately? 
I went to Israel in 1989. Yeah, 89. And then my wife was invited there in that summer. In 89, yeah. In 89, yeah. And you guys and get married in? 92. Uh, 92, yeah, yeah. 1992. Yeah, Shane was born in 92, yeah. 92, wow, it's beautiful. <laughs> it's, yeah. yeah. So I guess I want to, I guess you, you spoke about the um, the time you were in Granite. If you can, I guess, unpack that and start, I guess, from the beginning, of when you were introduced to Chabad, I guess, um, was it, right, your introduction to Chabad was through Rabbi Friedman. He started learning Netanya and all about your, your, your soul and that whole thing. And then when you got to Crown Heights, you started learning with Rabbi Majeski? Yes. Yeah, I went to Machon Chana, that's what it was called then, with Rabbi Majeski. And it was wonderful because, like, the Rebbe would speak, and then you'd go to school at Machon Khan, and Ramajeski would have it all translated for us and just constantly sharing with us what was really, what was being said. So it was like living and breathing everything, and Mrs. Wow. Gonsberg was in the dorm. It was very alive time. My Can you talk a little bit? Yeah. She just describes it as like, there was such an incredible energy. The girls would wake up every morning wondering, what did the Rebbe say? What did the Rebbe say? You know, how how much closer are we to the final, to the ultimate Hizgalas? When are we going to Yushalayim? And Rabbi, Rabbi Majeski would come in with the fresh off the press and give over the words of the Rebbe. I mean, it was like, it was like mamish, like living, you know, it's not like nowadays we go to a Svarim Shank and we take out, you know, Lekute Sichos or uh, Sefer Asichos or something like that. It's like, Every day they were just being fed from the night before, you know. It right. Was, uh, Fresh. Was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, it was Mash- like Crown Heights was on fire. Like there was no, there was Mashiach in the brain. It was just very exciting. Time. Had, uh, m- must be pretty incredible. I know even most Shluchim and people who are very involved, they, uh, you know, for good reasons, but they were not in Crown Heights at the time when the Rebbe spoke a lot of the Sikhs. One of the reasons I think. So many of the mainstream Lubavitch kind of forgot somewhat about uh, the message of the Yisichas is because they, they weren't there. They weren't, like you're saying, waking up every morning. What did the, what did the Rebbe say? They, they were involved in whatever they were doing, you know, in their Mokai Misash and then, yeah. you know, they had their mission statement. And, and they didn't necessarily hear every week, every day, a new Sikha, a new, new thing, a new, or they didn't have the time to fully invest and, and live. Where it sounds like what you're saying, that's what you were living. That was what was yeah. going on. The rubber. Yeah, that, definitely. That was what was going on. And and also, um, you know, as Baal Chuvas, we were talking about this, like, you know, I didn't have any respect for rabbis until I started to learn in the, you know, observant sector and orthodoxy. And so I had to develop that respect for rabbis. But then when it came to a rabbi and I was, at, you know, with Rabbi Friedman and Beis Chana and then even with Rabbi Jeski and the teachers there. So as Balchub is not only do you give up your entire life and, you know, change your whole thought process and everything about the world, but you're also told that a Rebbe, especially uh, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, who was the, you know, who is the Nasi Hador, the leader of the generation, you're told that nothing he does is a mistake and everything he does is conscious and a hundred percent and according to his, his will. And so, you know, with everything with Mashiach, it was just like, okay, you know what, this is all truthful. It's like, even the chaos, even, you know, everything that was going on that the Rebbe would speak now or the Rebbe would speak later. It was just, you know, the whole Seder was out of order, but, but this is who we were following. Like Mashiach is alive and well right here. CNN, you know, interviewed the Rebbe, like everybody can see that. One of the things that my wife likes to talk about during that time, just to, you know, just to flesh out the scene of what was happening, was the Rebbe would be speaking at night, who knows how, how many nights in a row, for whenever the Rebbe or chose to speak. Or giving something out. The Rebbe giving, giving something, something out. out, you know. And people would come in, my wife would tell me the stories, people would come in, they'd find out at eight o'clock at night in Boston that the Rebbe was speaking in Crown Heights. Or giving something out. Or giving out. something out. And people yeah. would get in their cars with their kids, their three or four kids, at eight o'clock at night in Boston. And they would come, and this is big every week. 
they'd get in their cars and they'd come with their kids. I mean, most people, <laughs> we, we've gone through that time when we've had young kids and we had to put them in school the next day and all this kind of stuff, you know, it's seven o'clock bedtime, it's seven o'clock, seven o'clock, you know, right. and at eight o'clock at night after the kids were sleeping, they'd wake them up, get them dressed, pack the lunch, you know, pack the dinners, whatever it is, get in the car, drive three hours, arrive in Crown Heights at 11 o'clock at night, 11, 30, 12 o'clock at night, then stand online with, with their little kids. kids. Yeah. And they get, a, you know, wait in line for two or three hours till two o'clock in the morning. And they'd get the, the, the safer or the, whatever the dollar, whatever it is the Rebbe was handing out at the time. And, you know, the bracha, and then they get back in and, and they may do this more than once a week. I mean, wow. this was going on constantly. Yeah. And, and this was the life that people would come in from, you know, Muncie was, if you didn't come in from Muncie, you know, <laughs> you know, people were coming in from all over the place. Yeah. Wow. And it was, I remember that first time and I wrote this in the book, like the first time that the Rebbe was giving something out, it was already 11 o'clock at night. And like the line was so long and I'm just like, okay, it's time to go to bed. Like, what are we doing? And we just happened to see Rabbi Majescu who said, no, what you get from a tzaddik, it's just, you know, it's that from that righteous person, it's that much more ingrained in you and that much more helpful for your learning and everything. And like, you know, it was really late. Like I, those lines were really six hours, seven hours long. And the Rebbe never sat down. The Rebbe literally stood there. I mean, it's, in, it's beyond to even think about. You know, because I knew that there was there was really no place to sit, but at least like there was, be, you know, bleachers to, you know, lean against or something. But the Rebbe literally just stood and met so many people. I'm very curious with what information you had about Mashiach before you came, I guess. Like what 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 was what was going through your mind, essentially, with the first time you encountered this concept of Mashiach and and. And, and I guess, how much did they tell you about Mashiach and Geula? And what was your impression when you first heard about it? Yeah. Are you, is it directed at my wife or myself? Wh whichever one of you, because both, I'm saying. I'm assuming it's very different answers. Correct. <laughs> I, didn't share yeah. maybe you knew, I don't think you even knew more. I mean, you know, I, I was in Asia tour. I was with, you know, of course, we, we learned about Mashiach. Of course, there was Mashiach energy, so to speak. Um, the whole world was moving a little bit closer towards this concept of Mashiach. And even back then, the Rebbe was bringing Mashiach into the general consciousness. Um, but definitely, we definitely saw Mashiach as something that, you know, Ad uh, B.S. Gael, you know, who knows when that's going to be. And we definitely looked at it as something, uh, you know, similar to the way we learned the Rambam, you know, the way we used to learn... The way the Rambam, have, the way we've learned the Rambam for hundreds of years, you know, you know, haka lo shibachoyim shiavo type thing, and when I when I came to Lubavitch and and you know it, it really was an eye opening for me. It did not feel normal at all. It felt like these people took some sort of drug <laughs> into this drug. <laughs> Besides for the fact that everyone looked like a zombie, if you ask me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> because they're, yeah, yeah, they're not they're just like robots you know everyone's like a robot you know like you know, it just uh, that's what he it, felt when he first was, came to, <laughs> even when he met me he was like you know i was like so lababich obsessed and never mashiach obsessed and at some point he said to me no one's ever heard of the frida karaba you know? <laughs> talking about lababich as if like i should know you know all the details you know I, i'm like where do you think I was? I mean, I mean, I'm in New Shalim, first of all, I'm not in New York. I'm in Asia Torah. No one talks. She acts. She, the way Lubavitch just look at the world, I learned from her is that, <laughs> is that whatever's going on in Chabad is front, right, and center for the rest of the world. You know, as if every other Jew has got this on their lips. You know, and I just looked at her like, you know, literally no one I knew or met, and I met a lot of people. I spent a lot of time in New Shalim, told us Aaron and. And South Bells Fallsburg, and South Fallsburg, you know, all different in places Chicago, in Chicago. Hotels. No one ever said anything about Lubavitch, Friedrich <laughs> Rebbe, this, that, you know. And she's acting as if, like, I should be, you know, reading uh, the Algamina Journal every day and, and, and know what's going on in the Chabad. But I will say this. That's how, that's how, yeah, that's how. Uh... <laughs> but what was so amazing was being in Crown Heights when the Scuds were going on, when the war, the Gulf War, because because there was that. Like we had, you know, the Rebbe telling us exactly what was going on. And, you know, obviously it was afraid, you know, it was fearful when the scud started to fall. But it was just like, it's like you had a different newspaper that you were looking at. And you just felt like 
wow, like we have the Rebbe's perspective and nobody in the world has that unless they're listening to the Rebbe's perspective. And it was, it was so incredible. I felt so blessed and lucky. It was so amazing. Yeah. I would, I would just, you know, it's, uh, we should probably mention that, uh, there are so many miracles going on now with all of the Yidin in Eretz Yisrael that are happening every day that, you know, we don't, I guess we don't have an habit to clearly show us and tell us exactly, you know, this is a miracle. Let's all thank Hashem for it. Like the Rebbe did then, but if the Rebbe did tell us that we need to uh, not make the same mistake Chizkiah made, but to rather open our eyes to see the miracles happening and, and uh, thank the Abishta for them. But yeah, then you can actually uh, be there. Then it was so tangible. It, it literally was like, like a different newspaper, you know, because I would go to Muncie sometimes to see my parents who, you know, were lived in Pomona, actually, who were very secular. And you could just feel like the, like not, not just the emptiness, but like there's a war going on and the scuzz and this and that. But then you go back to Crown Heights and you just felt like, no, there's a whole perspective going on and it's going to end term time and everything. It was so, it was really like, you just really feel that your eyes are open to a different way of seeing things. And I know my husband, and I feel that way now, even at, like about Yiddishkeit and Judaism. It's just like, our eyes are so different and it feels like it's the eyes of the mind you know but for me like i had never heard of mashiach concept so that was hard because i always thought that was christian the messiah was just a christian thing it was their thing uh so i was just like what are you talking about you know and then there's like the good times are gonna roll with gaula and wow it was all brand new who brand who, new. who introduced it to you it was rabbi friedman or rabbi majeski probably in probably in base with rabbi friedman yeah, I'm, wow. I'm pretty sure it was then. And again, it was like what a tzaddik is, who the Rebbe is, you know, the leader of the generation, how that makes him different, and Mashiach. Yeah, kind of, it kind of all it. flows. Yeah, it makes moving moving back just a second. It reminded me, like, uh, I remember with uh, either some of my siblings or other people, but especially when you have young Chabad kids talking to other kids their age who are, who are not Chabad, like. You don't know what today's Chav Ches Nizam? Like, like, <laughs> <laughs> I remember one of my friends became another one, another one of my friends from Grinnell College, uh, right. Yassel Schwartz, Dr. Yassel Schwartz. He became uh, Lubavitch. It's not really, really written much about it in the book, but... No, yeah, yeah they know is. of him. Joel. Oh, yeah, Joel. Oh, Joel. Joel, yeah. Yeah, I would call so, Joel up and say, like, hey, what's going on what's with, going David? with David? Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. My one trip to Israel and, and both of the people who I affected, you know, to become from, both became these radical. <laughs> I guess it was a matter of time. <laughs> and, like, and I remember once he called me up and I gave him, evidently it was Kislev, and he calls me and he says, good Yontif, you know? And now I happen to be a very absent-minded person. And I was in Chicago when he <laughs> called me. So I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, like, what is it? Shavuos? <laughs> is it like, I don't know. <laughs> And it was Rosh Hashanah. I had no idea what day it was, you know. And and, uh, and uh, but it, it was just very interesting. He expected me to like, oh, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's the, the day of the, you know, the, the freedom of the uh, altar <laughs> Oh, it was yeah. Kislev, yeah. So, and uh, yeah, that's a very funny way that we look at the world now. I, uh, Hashanah, I think you described it very well. That we have this person. in our world, the Lab- in the Babbage's world, we're the center of the whole galaxy, and and. <laughs> We have it going on. We have the Rebbe, the Amosha Abinu, telling us exactly what's going on. And uh, this perspective um, irritates so many of the regular Litvish world who say, what do you mean? We have Aguda, we're Das Terra, and, and you don't even look at us. Like, like who, do you, who do you think you are with your Rebbe over here? Like, like, like you know, what's that? You know, <laughs> can we do Ramba? You know? For me, it was an issue because what happened was, was that I was like, I didn't care. I didn't know the difference, Lubavitch, not Lubavitch. Even when I went to, you know, Beis Khan Rabbi Friedman, like it didn't matter to me. I didn't get the differences. And so I remember I would go to people's houses who were, that I had met from Asia Torah. They were living in the United States. And, um, but what happened was there was such an antagonism to Lubavitch that when I would sit there for Shabbos, they would say things that weren't, weren't pleasant. And, and it felt very, uh, bad to me. And I just realized like, I cannot, I can't live in those two worlds, you know? And so I stopped, I stopped going. I stopped going. I remember once a friend called, someone I knew from Israel, she called me up, you want to come for Shabbos? I said, 
are you going to speak against Lubavitch? And, uh, you know, well, we have our opinions or whatever. I said, no, thank you. I, I couldn't go because I love Lubavitch. I also loved Asia Tor. I loved Orthodoxy. It was fine at that point in my life. But I can't sit there and hear why I shouldn't, you know, be in Lubavitch or what's going on. And so that battle, I think, is, you know, kind of over nowadays. But yeah, I was going to say that largely today, it's much more, Lubavitch yeah. is much more, uh, much more accepted and considered Definitely. much more. Uh, I don't know. Normal, I don't want to say normal, but uh, <laughs> still not normal. Still not there yet. Not normal, not normal. And it's very funny because even sometimes now I'll speak to people. I'll go to Tehillim groups where there are non Lubavitchers, and I'll use language that's so common to Lubavitchers about the soul or this or that, and they haven't heard of it. And it's just like wow. In some ways. We you know, still have a lot of work to do. We still have a lot of work to do as Lubavitchers. We really got to get the, the Hasidus, you know, pumped out there to more people so they understand it's like Mashiach language, you know? So the, we we uh, mentioned the, the Scud missiles, the whole war in Eretz Yisrael, and you you uh, mentioned uh, your perspective in Crown Heights, how it was. Um, David, you were you were there? You were in Eretz Yisrael in, at the time? At that as, time, uh, no. Was actually learning here here in Chicago and, and tells Yeshiva over here in Chicago. Oh. Yeah, but I was not there. No, I thought he was there. Right, right. I didn't yeah. know where he was. Oh wow! Yeah, and and we're like yeah, there what was. Right. What was the perspective in Chicago? How was how was it? What, were the, well, what was the conversation? The I mean, it, essentially fear based. You know, a lot of fear surrounding what was happening. People were confused. Um, you know, no one. Everyone was. A, a lot of anxiety, low confidence, you know, what you would expect, you know, from regular people who don't have the, the insight of the Rebbe, you know, it, 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 the Rebbe's, the Rebbe's approach and the energy that he put out was definitely unique. It was not something that was shared by Gedoli Yisrael or anything of that sort. Were people there discussions were, about what the Rebbe was saying? Like, again, <laughs> if, if anything, it would have been, you know, another crazy thing is coming out of, you know, 770 type attitude, not right. uh, anything that people would say, wow, you know, <laughs> maybe we should try doing that, <laughs> you know, unfortunately. Yeah, we're, we're, we're mentioning how, how Lubavitch thinks that everybody's talking about us and thinking about us. And, and, <laughs> and a part of, part of what I was expecting to hear from you is like, oh, yeah, we think we were talking about Lubavitchers all the time. I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> apparently not. <laughs> not even the negative, not the positive, unless you mention the word. Right, right, right. But it wasn't, it wasn't like a topic of conversation, I guess. All right. <laughs> as much as we, you know, as much as we say, okay, the rabbit goes like this and the whole world shifts, which it does, but nobody else knows that that's what's happening. Right, right. People aren't in tune. No, so I wanted to, I wanted to ask you if if there when this whole um, Nunalif and Nunbeis the the whole fervor of Mashiach if it was I guess it's I, I don't know how much of a, a topic it was of a conversation but like was there uh, was there a similar fervor of like oh this is what Lubavitch is saying and this is what Lubavitchers are thinking that the Rebbe is Mashiach and I guess what was the reaction towards that think yeah I think I think that the 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 number one kind of approach that the non Lubavitch world had from my perspective. Now, don't forget, I'm about Shuva, like a deer with, you know, caught in the headlights. I don't know that much, you know, in, amazingly in Asia Torah, we were so privy to have, you know, very big Gedoli Yisrael come through the yeshiva just to kind of like meet us and see what's happening. And all of us about Shuvas, we didn't know, you know, we had the Rosh Yeshiva of Mir came and Rabbi Kanevsky came and Rabbi Kham came and all these different people came just to see what was going on. And they would sit in, you know, in their way for bread with us, you know, and it's just fascinating because people would, you know, pay a lot of money from America to go around these tours to get Yechidas or whatever they call it on their version. And they would all just come strolling through a yeshiva. But the, the, the main way that they kind of dealt with the Lubavitch issue was to cut us off from really, not cut us off consciously, but they just would silently not mention anything. And the only time that I kind of came into contact with Chabad was when I decided to reach out to my wife and um, resume the Shidduch process with her after years of us being separated. And when that happened, that's when I realized that all of my teachers and rabbis who were much more learned than me and steeped in the Orthodox world 
were extremely familiar with Chabad and had very strong opinions about what was happening and knew exactly what the Rebbe was saying and were completely aware of what was happening in Crown Heights. Uh, it, it was completely shielded from us in the yeshivas, but these people knew they they were watching, you know, the CNN of their of their <laughs> thing daily, you know. The Chabad News what, Network. Yeah. <laughs> there was no Google. Who knew? Yeah. And and that's when all the stuff came out about the Mashiach and the Rebbe and, and what was happening in Crown Heights. And it was, you know, it was quite fascinating to me. I mean, to hear that there's a, a you know, I, I'm going to call the Rebbe at that time, a gentleman, you know, a, a rabbi at that time who was taking the mantle of the Jewish world. I mean, one of their tainas to me was this rabbi thinks he's the leader of the Jewish world. You know, like, you know, exactly right. you know, you know and, and some of them are even in calling him the Messiah, you know, and that to them was like, you know, blasphemy, so to speak, you know, and um, like you mentioned earlier, they're, they've, they've excluded themselves from the general Jewish population, you know, and they doing things their own way and they don't participate in things that we do and they're on their own derech you know, in Yiddishkeit and, you know, it's, it's not our way, you know? And, and so there was a lot of, I don't want to get into the negative, a lot of the negative stuff. It's just that they knew exactly what, to, to answer your question, they knew exactly what the rebel was saying pretty much daily. But they weren't talking <laughs> about it. <laughs> yeah. They wouldn't, tell, they wouldn't tell it to me until it became an issue. Like it was like ad, on an as needed basis, they would inform me of what was happening in Crown Heights to make sure that I understood that, you know, I should you stay away. Stay basically. away from, from them. <laughs> yeah, it was definitely about staying away. But what I found so strange was that the night that the Rebbe had the stroke, the first stroke, when I went to the dorm, the phone rang. And again, it was a phone booth in the basement. Anyone could have picked it up or not picked it up. But um, it was Rabbi Aaron Cutler, you know, and he was in South Fallsburg at that time. And, you know, David, David had already or David had already contacted him. But how he knew, how, how did he get that dorm basement telephone number? And then I mean, this is probably something we can ask him. Sometimes we're in touch with him. But and also to call that night, you know, this the strange divine providence of calling literally Chaf yeah, yeah, and then ask how everything's going. And and again, with Chaf Zayinadar, when the Rebbe had the stroke, you know, we thought, oh, this is the transformation. That's how we were thinking. This is the transformation of Mashiach, you know, of Messiah. And so when he asked me how I was doing, it was like, great. Everything's great. You know, and wow. we didn't know it was a stroke. <laughs> we didn't know it was a stroke. Like nobody, nobody in my circles knew it was a stroke that night. The next day we found out, but it was like, great everything's great you know and it turns out that rabbi cutler has a very very amazing stories with with the rebbe also because the rebbe was even involved in his mother's shiva you know so that's that's very powerful the connection wow. all these connections are so interesting so your very feeling at the time and and this that there was no universe where the rebbe wasn't going to take a set of gullas that was mashiach was happening there was one course there was no question no strokes, I, strokes I hit and strokes I had. There was not. <laughs> and it wasn't just my wife. I mean, I was there during that time a little bit later. I came on the scene very shortly afterwards. Um, and um, it, it wasn't just my wife. I mean, I don't know what picture. No one can repaint my picture. That no one can do because I was there, right? Now, you two obviously are younger than me, so I don't know what you've been exposed to. But... I can tell you that there was nobody who was accepted. I mean, there was always some rabbi who was looked down upon somewhere, some Chabad house. Where Maybe I never every, heard about well, it. We, we lived near one. Um, oh, that was, yeah, yeah that okay. was that was looked down upon like he hmm. was an outcast. You know, but everybody, everybody was a mishichist. The, 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 the word mishichist didn't even make sense. There was no such. You were a Chabad. Chabad. Right? Yeah, you were a Chabad, yeah. right? And and it wasn't... That, and just to define terms, because people uh, whitewash history. So everyone was a Mishkis that everyone believed what? Everyone was thinking what? Everyone was sitting on pins and needles, waiting with 100% confidence that the Rebbe is going to get up from before uh, uh, Chavzai and other and after. And Chavzai afterwards. And afterwards, that the Rebbe was going to get up and be Megala 
that he is the King Mashiach that we've been waiting for for yeah. thousands of years and march us into Eretz Yisrael with the Beis HaMikdash and the whole thing. And like whatever else we say every Shabbos after a, a good vort. The, the real deal. <laughs> There was one time that the Rebbe, and I don't remember which date this was, maybe you would know, but where the Rebbe walked into 770, nobody was even there. It was like Mincha time, um, or it was before Mincha time. And, and the, Rebbe just, the Rebbe didn't even sit in the regular spot. It was like the strangest time. Like that's the whole thing, everything being out of order. And everybody started running to 770. And again, and the Rebbe sat in a completely different spot. It was like the strangest thing. And everybody was just like, you know, saying, it's like, oh, this is it. This is it. You know, the Rebbe is Magal. I mean, that's, we lived on, that's wow. how it was, you know. And, and even during the times of, you know, a little bit later after the stroke with the beepers and everything, yeah. I was just telling my son that, you know, um, we sang Yechi, I don't know if you remember a few years ago, again, you two are a little bit younger, but I don't know how many years ago it was, there was a, there was the Kines Shluchim. There was the the Kinnis Shluchim that happened, the Mishachist one, where there was this Hasidish guy that got up there and said, you know, we need to say Yechi like a Nun Aleph Yechi. I don't know if you two remember him saying that, a nice Hasidish man that got up there with his, you know, uh, um, you know, the, yeah, with, with, with his trial. Yeah, what he oh, did, wow. he was like, cool. we have to say Yechi like a Nun base or a Nun Aleph or whatever it was Yechi. And with that, you know, what that means for those who weren't there, we would come into 770 and we'd see the, the Rebbe sitting in the balcony and people would be singing Yechi for hours, like hours. And it was packed. And it was like this trance that people would get into. I mean, it really was. If somebody took a video of this, <laughs> and let's say that's not necessarily a good luck, but <laughs> you know, we <laughs> were hours singing Yechi with such a fire and like everybody was there everybody was anybody was there i mean i'm not saying that there weren't individuals that were in their apartments whatever i can't, can't speak for every individual but that was definitely the energy in crown heights we were it's like if you ever seen a rocket ship take off before the rocket ship actually blasts off there's all this flames and smoke that are coming out from underneath the rocket ship and that's what's crown heights like they were just it wasn't it wasn't like countdown it was past countdown and all the fuel was burning from the bottom, just ready to take off. You know, because the Rebbe said that, like, now's the time, and even before Mincha, Mashiach can come. And so it was it was being built up like that. And then the Rebbe was saying so many powerful words, if you, you know, as you, you have read from the Sikhas, the women were giving jewelry, the, you know, it, it was just, and we needed to receive Mashiach. So we were all trying to find what is the key to make this happen, you know, and... um <laughs> You know, obviously we didn't find it in the way that we wanted to, but so that was hard. But we thought even the singing of Yechi, because what is that? It's receiving, you know, Mashiach. So if we sang loud enough, strong enough, it's like letting God know, letting the Rebbe know, like we are here, we're ready, you know? Yeah, there's very a, curious. Uh, go for it. I, it's, it's just so good to hear it because it's, it's so important. Like I was saying before, people whitewash history. Especially because it's so many years later, it's it's so important for people to hear. Uh, we also obviously have the Rebbe Sikhas, but also all of the like you're describing the what we call the Arun, the atmosphere of what it was like to be there. What were what was the mainstream people? People like to think whatever's mainstream. That's what people like to believe. But to hear that that was the mainstream thing at the time. That that you know this uh, that that Rebbe's Mashiach, he's taking us out of Galus. We need to agree and this is happening. And, and that most importantly. That it matters and that it's important. One of the biggest uh, things, and I've heard this even from very, some very big uh, mashpim and important people, who cares who Mashiach is? He'll come whenever it happens, and uh, let me know. <laughs> we'll do the pyramid this, and and that was just so much not at all. The, the no. just that's just not a thing at the no, time. Because we needed the point. This is Mashiach. Mashiach's alive and well, and Mashiach's. Right here so now. The way and... everyone understood the Rebbe's, uh, what the Rebbe wanted us to do at the time, when the Rebbe was actually saying these sikhs, was that it does matter, it is important, we should focus on this, and and let's all get involved and then greet Mashiach and then make it happen. Oh, 
Oh, yeah, and Menachem Shmo, his name is Menachem. Without the Rebbe, never said I am Mashiach. Right, never. It's ever, so but, funny, but everybody people. was. I mean, it was so close. Well, to he said saying. he said that his father in laws Mashiach, so it's either him or his father in law. So <laughs> yeah. it's funny. It, exactly. Either one is either one is fine. <laughs> yeah. But it's so funny to hear people kind of like I've been at some of these um, uh, sessions here in Chicago where they're, they're like dissecting what the Rebbe meant by these sikhas and all these, well, he didn't really say it's him, da, da, da. and it's, it's, it's almost, it's cringy, but an ironic and hysterical at the same time to hear people try to recreate what the Rebbe actually meant when we were there, you know, with, yeah. you, you're, you're trying to tell me what the Rebbe meant. I was there, you know, and my wife is there much more than me. You know, and 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 now that I'm looking through the way they're being mediac and trying to make a, 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 a point off of this thing and, and and point off of that thing, and I was like, no, 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 you don't understand. Like, you, you got it all wrong. Like, you did, you're totally <laughs> off. You know, and um, I don't know. It, you know, eno doime real is shmia. You know, it, it's completely different. Yeah, yeah. the rabbi and speaks also- about it when it when it comes to the constitution with regards to the moment of silence, like. You have to look at the context. Who are the people? You everyone, all these judges sitting here, you know, inventing penumbras in the Constitution. It's like that was like. Do you know who these people were who wrote it? They were very <laughs> religious. Like, what are you talking? That- what are you talking about? Like, what, you got to got to know the context of what was going on then. Like, the, yeah. before you start making stuff up about. Uh, yeah, was, yeah. Yeah. So it's like it's funny because we we you know all Litvish people and Orthodoxy and other Hasidim and everybody, you know we. We pray for Mashiach, Messiah, every single day, many times a day. We talk about it. Everybody's talking about it now. Since October 7th, everybody knows this is the only answer. But who are they thinking? Like, who are they voting in for Mashiach? Like, who are they pointing to? What are they, he's going to fall from the sky? And Lubavitchers actually say, like, or at least, you know, Lubavitchers who want to say it, the Rebbe is Mashiach. And yes, there's a source that, the, that Mashiach will come from a place we can't see. But but we know who it is. Yeah, right. You it's know? it's definitely it's definitely a thing that Lubavitch has to step up and do is that everybody's looking, everybody's want right. You're saying after after October seventh, this is the only answer. This is the only thing we have left. Like for like um, like in Chavzai Nader, everybody was like, of course, the only next step is the Rebbe to stand up and 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 reveal himself. There was no there was no thought of like after, and like yeah, Lubavitch has to go and do it. Like Rabbi, like uh, Rabbi Wolf was saying, how he he felt that we need to. This is our job. Our job is that the Rebbe gave us everything. He revealed everything. He put himself out there, and and for us to bring it to the world and to bring everybody to Mashiach. And and it was it's just very interesting. Um, I'm very curious, actually, um, Miriam, if if you can, I guess, talk to the to the point of. When, as you were becoming more, becoming more firm, you always had questions. You were always like questioning, and and you never really, like like your story. You never fully accepted it at, in the beginning. It took it took time. You you weren't so into it, and and I'm very curious as to, I guess was Mashiach not the same? Did you not have the same, like, thing, or it was just like you jumped right in? How how, how did how did that work out in in your mind? I guess if you can if you can talk to that. Yeah, I think that actually was like, like a pinnacle for me. It was like, it was, you know, I'd always been so concerned about suffering in the world. I was always pained by it. I, I used to work with animals and, and, uh, you know, whether it was, pol- you know, pollution, all this kind of stuff. So I really wanted a better world. So when I, when I got into Judaism and observing Judaism and, and that was like very excited. And I started to take things off. And once the carrot was gone from the stick and I really had to make the decision, I'm doing this for me. So then my learning did accelerate and I really kind of put my whole self in, even though there was always, there's always going to be questions about God and how could this be and Holocaust stuff. But, you know, um, but I, I think what it was, was that I was really looking for a world that there wouldn't be suffering. So when I heard about Gula, redemption and Mashiach, it was just like, OK, like, that's fantastic. That's, that's, that's what I want. This is what this is what I want. So instead of healing one seal at a time, let's just like do the whole thing at once. So I think that was like for me and it still is for me, everything. It's for me, everything. October 7th, it's less like. Let's get our acts together, guys, because, you know, there's nothing else. There's Even nothing why else. you wrote your book, Tiffany. Even why I wrote my book. I mean, in terms of being obsessed with Mashiach. Yeah, my wife 
all the time, the whole eight years that it took her to write that book, all she kept talking about is, I'm doing this with the Rebbe, I'm doing this with wow. our son in the world, Mashiach in the world. She goes, yes, it's our story. Yes, we're, we're characters in this in this situation here, but, but the real driving force for my wife is that she wants the world to, you know, somehow through our story to hear and learn about the Rebbe as Mashiach. Yeah, and that, that the Geula and that the world is going to a better place. Because when you speak to secular people, um, it's like, okay, the world could end or pollution or global warming or something like that. And I want to say like, no, there's there's Kabbalah, there's Jewish mysticism, there's a better, we're moving towards a revealed good, not a revealed bad. And so that's like just my whole yeah, I was like this before, you know, I got into Judy, you know, Yiddishkeit because I was wanting to save the world or refugees or something. And then when I found out about, you know, Mashiach being a Jewish concept and everything, I'm like, okay, let's make this happen, you know. Yeah, this, that, was, that was your selling point, essentially. The whole well, uh, look. I was already involved in Judaism, but I really loved this point. This was exciting. You're saying it, it connected, you connected to it specifically. It resonated. Res it resonated. It resonated. The whole thing was original. mindset of uh, this Tikkun Olam style, let's, let's fix the world to social uh, justice, which is extremely prevalent uh, now. It's, I, I guess, kind of, it's a sign of Gula. It's a sign of it, this Mashiach energy is in the air. People want, people didn't always want the world to be a better place. Like we take it, kind of take it for granted now that the bad people are the guys that are trying to fix the world this way. And then the good guys, everyone is, <laughs> how do we fix the world? But, uh, you know, you, you got to stop killing people. You're killing civilians. Like how, 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 how dare you? I mean, it's, it's not about that really, but even the, the supposed bad side is misguided, the uh, Mashiach energy. When you look historically, everyone was like, no, let's kill everybody. <laughs> that was, that, those were the heroes. So, so uh, the world has taken a decided turn towards Mashiach energy. It's in the air. People so often we're scared of our own shadow. We're scared to talk to people about Mashiach. What are they going to say? What are they going to think? It sounds Christian, but everybody want like you're saying. This was so good for you to hear this. Oh wow, Mashiach! That that's what I'm looking for. People want to hear about it. We have to talk to them. People are waiting to hear. Oh, you mean there's an actual person, Mashiach? He's going to take us out of Gullah? Like. That's great news. <laughs> That's not a That's great news. We're going toward good times of revelation. And, you know, and it was so interesting because I became a coach just a few years ago or about 10 years ago. And, you know, non-Jewish coaches were telling stories and, and quoting the Baal Shem Tov. It was crazy. It was like, wow, you know, or Matis Yahu, like beating out, you know, the Baal Shem Tov story and about Mashiach, like out in loudspeakers to people who weren't even Jewish. Like the world is so ripe and ready for like, again, better times, revelation. And, and someone like the Rebbe who so caring, so compassionate, you know, he sees into your soul. He wants what's best for you. I mean, it's just like, yeah, how hard can this cell be, you know? Yeah. If we're so inspired so about it, we'll be able to. Uh, if, if we're if we can convince ourselves somewhat about it, we'll have a bit easier time trying to convince other people. But that's uh, not that it should stop you. But that's where it's got to start to convince yourself that this is real. This is happening. This is something we have to care about. And uh, yeah, yeah. Like honestly, that Mashiach, I would... flag, that Mashiach flag that was yeah. that you know when the journalist trying to say or the reporter CBS. trying to say. CBS, like Moshi. Ah. Oh, that, <laughs> like, what's this new flag? People who know. Yeah, it's so exciting. Before, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I wanna, I wanna go back to, to I guess the, the, the story, your story, um, and I wanna ask David. I wanna ask you. I guess when did you, 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 you again? Like you said, you weren't the Lubavitch, and then when you started the whole Mashiach process and getting into Chabad for you, I want to know. Yeah, it's, it's, um, I'll tell you, I'll tell you two, two things that I'll, that were really, you know, first of all, I just want to thank all the Lubavitchers and the rabbis along my way, including Rabbi Aaron Dovin Gans and Rabbi Majeski and many people who definitely helped me with my own personal journey. I connected much better to, you know, since I thought, most mainstream Lubavitchers like Robotrons, you know, so I would, I would hang out and spend time with people who had come to Chabad. And uh, that's one of the reasons why Rabbi Reuven Wolf and I had 
hit it off so well because he came from the, I mean, I, I, my feet, I dip my feet into a similar background as where he had come from. And so, you know, that was a, that was a big part of my journey was, um, you know, having the opportunity to learn with some great people. Uh, I'll tell you one story. There's a Rabbi Shane who's from Teaneck and he had come to, he had come to uh, Muncie, I think during a Sheva Brachas and a young man, I was a few years older than him and he had, it was his turn to speak at the Verbrangen or the Sheva Brachas and he gave over the Rabbi Sicha about Purim. Uh, I think, I, I forgot the name. Is Sheva Brachas? No, no, his Sheva Brachas. Oh, his, his Sheva Brachas, Brachas. yeah. And when I heard him speak about the different levels of the neshama and what was going on in the whole Gemara and the, in the Midrash there and the way the Rebbe explained it, my mind, and I'll never forget it. I mean, I, I, I know to everybody who has learned Sichas before, it's like, okay, this is just another one of the Rebbe Sichas. But you don't understand, I was a very good student in Yeshiva. I went from Eshet to uh, to Lakewood and into an all-Israeli yeshiva. I spent hours in the base of Midrash learning some of the top rabbis there. Now, I'm not a going or anything close to that or anything like that. I'm just saying I was exposed to the top of the top. And I had never heard anybody give over a shot and a understanding of, um, of a section of Torah the way he had given it over directly from the Rebbe's words. I was like in shock. I never heard that, never heard anything like that. And I said to myself right then, I wasn't Lubavitch at the time, I was davening the Tzemach Tzedek Shul with Rabbi Vichnu Olav Shalom because that's where we lived in Muncie. And at that moment, I said to myself, this is something I have to get involved in. Wow. <laughs> that was like my first, because I, 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 I you know, you could talk all day long about the Rebbe and the, this Rabbi and the politics and what is the meaning of Hasidus. But when I heard him give over that Torah, it just went right into my right into my heart and right into my soul. And uh, it was amazing. That's the first thing. And then the second thing, as you gentlemen have already uncovered from that previous podcast, is I had the schus of learning with Rabbi Wolf pretty much every day. We were Chavrusas in Kolo in Muncie. So not only do we learn Nigla together, which he's obviously very talented, you know, now that I'm older, I realize he was just, he was just really doing me a chesed. He wasn't, you know, he was like tutoring, basically. I should have paid him for tutoring. <laughs> we all remember. <laughs> um, but at the time I felt like, okay, you know, I'm learning with this guy, you know? Um, and then we would spend hours, I wish it was hours every day, but we spent many, many hours over the course of our relationship learning chesedists. And one of the things that the only Rabbi Wolf, in my estimation, can do so brilliantly is he started me out with like learning the Alter Rebbe's Torah, and then we moved down to the Mitla Rebbe, and then to the Semach Tzedek. And he would choose specific Maimarim, specifically dealing with this concept of his Galas of Hasidus. The revelation of the, Hasidus. Yeah, the revelation of Hasidus. And he did it very methodically. And by the time we got to the Rebbe, it didn't, I didn't even need to learn anything the Rebbe had said. I was already, by the time we finished the Friedrich Rebbe's Torah, I already knew what the outcome was going to be. There was but, no but Now other... you knew who the Friedrich Rebbe was. Now you know. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, I figured it was. So, like, there's different approaches, you know, to how to become a chassid. I needed the more intellectual approach. That's, maybe that's just the way I am. But... It was clear from the learning and from the understanding that I had received, and Rabbi Wolf wasn't alone. This is the general attitude of all the Lubavitchers back then, that I'll be Hasidus, I'll be all of Torah from starting from Moshe Rabbeinu till 1990, uh, 1994, 1994, there was no other option than the Rebbe being Mashiach. And so that's that. That was the chinuch I got. <laughs> so uh, to the first point you made, I could just talk personally. There's, it's like it's so it's so satisfying to hear you know the Rebbe's explanation for Yamtaf and a mimer, or and or, or the Rebbe's answer to a uh, one of these what's called a klutz kasha, these obvious in your face questions that nobody asks yeah. about the most rudimentary and basic things in Yiddishkeit or Yam Tevim. 
Yeah. And you know the answer is going to get to the heart of the matter, and it's going to be so satisfying, and it's going to really shed a whole new light on, on, on every level and explain, oh, this is what it is. It's not like, okay, you've answered the question. It's like, yeah. you, you, you've you got it. It's, this is what this is what Purim is. This is what, you know, this is this is what this mitzvah is all about. And that's really what Chassidus is here to do. They uh, yeah. they just started, I learned in 770, they're just starting now to give Shurim on the Kunturis and Yonah Shul Tarsach uh-huh. Chassidus. I mean, I've le- I've, uh, I haven't I've have started learning it now, but I've learned it before. It, it's, where the Rebbe goes through, explains Moda'ani according to Pshat, Ramesh Dush and Said, according to Chassidus, and explains how Chassidus is the highest of everything and how now that you Chassidus isn't pshat Ramesh Dush or side, it's chayas. And now that yeah. you have this chayas, this pshat according to Chassidus, you go back and revisit each of the pshat of pshat Ramesh Dush and side, the simple way, the the way of uh, hinting and the way of of um, exit Jesus and and say this, the secrets of Torah, the Kabbalah, and you see how each of them have now been breathed into them a whole new energy. Now that Chassidus is here to light them up, and that's really the way you feel. I guess by me, at least, particularly by the Rebbe's Chassidus, but uh, by each Rebbe, probably, by each Chassidim of the Rebbe, the, you know, the, <laughs> that's how amazing. they feel. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. It was eye-opening for me because, you know, in, in, Litvish, in Litvish schools, like, one of the big things is they teach you, you know, you have to make up your own, you have to make your own Chadushim. So that's, like, the big thing. So let's just say, on my vort, on my vort, so... I took a look at a Toysos that I had learned and I compared it to Rashi. And then I kind of came up with some, some drush about the difference, you know, the way that learning the Sugya. And then I compared, you know, then I, then I connected to the, the you know, to the Vort, to my wife and, you know, this and that. And, you know, it's nice, you know, it's good. I, I you know, it, I like doing it. It's fun. And it's, it's beautiful when a Jew is able to look inside and come up with a Chedish, right? And, and that was like the extent to which a lot of the Torah that you learned, uh, reached which is beautiful but there's no there's not even words to describe the difference between difference. something like that as beautiful as it is to what i heard this gentleman speaking about i was shocked <laughs> amazing although for the record the rabbi encouraged everyone to write chidushim and then everyone yes. has to write chidushim and chidushim and chidus everyone according to the level that was something that uh i'm uh, i probably should yeah. work on but the rabbi was high, highly yeah. highly encouraged <laughs> encouraged uh that to write kedushim in books it doesn't matter if it's the most accurate or not try write publish i was always there was constant refrain you see in dollars publish write books do it you see in letters you know when when's the next book this is for the next book this is uh yeah yeah it's amazing and what's interesting too is that from my end it's kind of like i had this answer from the rebbe that that he would become a lababitzer and meanwhile do you, want to, looked- do you want to tell over that story I can just because, like, from the other end of things. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Do you want? You comfortable saying it over? What? That whole section of the book. Oh, why? I shouldn't surprise everybody or something. (laughs) Spoiler. Yeah, spoiler. The whole this whole thing is spoiler alert. Spoiler spoiler alert. (laughs) The Rebbe was very instrumental, obviously, in us coming together, basically. Right, but it was just like again what the Rebbe says again as a Baal's Chuva, as someone who is, you know, becoming more observant of Judaism, what I had learned about the Rebbe is that what the Rebbe says happens, you know, that's it. And there wasn't a question, there's no mistakes. And so I feel like that was also part of my my book, you know, and part of my journey was that it looked impossible for, for the Rebbe's words to come true about my husband. I mean, Rabbi Aaron Cutler was his rabbi. And had told him, don't learn Tanya with a Lubavitcher, you know, like the whole thing. And we lived up in South Fallsburg in that area, you know. Um, Aaron Cartman so, Jr. <laughs> no, it was the grandson, you know. So yeah. I said to myself, well, how is he going to become a Lubavitcher if I don't make him one, you know, which is exactly the opposite of what a woman is supposed to do, a wife is supposed to do. So I thought, what about Lubavitch and this about Lubavitch and this. how could you not know the Rebbe's Mashiach, the whole thing? And finally, Rabbi Jeski said, you know, don't say anything about Lubavitch. Don't say Lubavitch. Don't say anything. And it was when I shut my mouth, you know, that everything unfolded. We winded up moving to Muncie and, and Revi, Rabbi Ruvain and like Hashem like just came through in the way it was meant to be. But, you know, it's just, it's just so fascinating mm-hmm. is that, 
And what the Rebbe said, which looked impossible, came true. So we can say that now with Geula, Mashiach, whatever it is. What, you know, the Rebbe said it, it's true, that's it, period. It's going to happen. So when with um, when you connected with Rabbi Wolf, it, that was Tavshin and Beis, that was 1990, 91, 92? Yeah, 92, no, 93. Oh, yeah, okay. After 92. It was after the stroke, so it was like 93. Oh, wow. Yeah, 94. Yeah, because my whole letter to the Rebbe about whether right, I should have Right, was after the stroke. After the stroke. So I guess if you, can, if you can talk about what happened when the first time when the Rebbe came out on the porch, we, I guess you weren't, you weren't in Crown Heights. You were in Muncie already? Uh, yeah, we yeah, were in Muncie yes, already. Yes. So you were in Muncie for Simchos Teira or you guys went in... Did you guys... Do that we went, like during Yom we went in. Yeah, the first time I saw the rabbi was uh, was in uh, uh, in Rosh Hashanah. Um, I believe it was 1993. And Yom Kippur, you were there. Yeah, too. Yom Kippur in Rosh Hashanah for 1993, and that's when the rabbi came out. And um, you know, it was just like I said, it, the whole shul was turned around. Everybody was diving to the other side, which we're not used to doing now. Um, and you know, it was just it was like even even then it was complete chaos. You know, it was people. Some people had a sitter, some people didn't have a sitter. No one cared about a sitter because they're like, Sheena's <laughs> right there. Who needs a sitter? You know, people couldn't dive on their smartphones back then. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they they just it was it was such a uh, I mean the whole all the energy in the show obviously was focused on you know the rebbe and and you know I, I, it's been such a long time I don't remember which exact times I was there that the Rebbe came out for how long. But um, obviously that was the, obviously that was the main event. The shoals were, the show was packed, obviously. You got honey cake, I think from the Rebbe, right? Yeah. Didn't you, no, know, you were online, you were there with R- Rabbi Ruben. Anyway. So um, yeah, I mean, it was, I was, I felt, you know, the energy in the room itself was so uplifting and so majestic. You know, we talk about Malchus, right? And I think this is an interesting point too. You know, as it says, you know, Ein Melech Bli Am, you know, and, and I believe that it's not it's just, so there's no, there's no king without a nation. And what, one of the things that I learned when I was in Crown Heights, that it's not just that you have to have followers to be a king, but the followers believing you're the king makes you the king. And that's how it felt in Crown Heights. So it, it, it was like the energy in the room, the way people were eagerly with bated breath waiting. And then when the Rebbe would come out, people would just be in awe and just so thankful and grateful to have a glimpse of the Rebbe and to be able to, you know, look at every single thing the Rebbe did and to sing Yechid to the Rebbe and to just, you know, participate with having the Rebbe there in the room was just, the energy was insanely uh, high, you know, incredible energy. And, I, again, I, as coming from where I was, uh, I remember a story once where I was in Yeshiva, in, in Yeshiva Sanega, Rabbi Yisachar Meir, and he was the Rosh Yeshiva there. And they were very kind to me, all good people and everything like that. And I remember one time they there was a bus that was leaving the Yeshiva to go to B'nai Brak. So I asked, you know, what's this bus for? They said, oh, the Rosh Yeshiva, because really the Yeshiva there was connected to Panovich. So the Rosh Yeshiva in Panovich is giving a, a talk tonight. And literally, I don't know, 20% of the kids, 20% of the kids went on the bus. The bus was basically empty, leaving to go see the, the Rebbe. The, their, no, not the Rebbe. Their Rebbe. Rabbi. Their, whatever, whatever. Anyway, the point I'm trying to say is not to in any way put anybody down or anything like that. It's just this is totally different. It was a completely different way. You know, I'd never seen anything. The, the kids are, I'd never seen anything like this, where... It wasn't the twenty percent of the Jews that were paying attention to the Rebbe. It was a hundred and ten percent, it giving a hundred percent of their energy. And nobody thought then that uh, maybe the Rebbe didn't know what he was doing, Kasu Shalom, and who knows if he's really encouraging it or he just wanted to be happy that with the Siddim. No, but these thoughts, nobody had oh. such a. If anybody were to say such a thing, you've heard of Chapsim, right? Like you've heard of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody were to even utter such a word, I mean, I can't even imagine that going through somebody's mind. But it, it, certainly not the Dibor. I mean, that's nothing like that at all. It was 
the Rebbe was every tnua up there, every motion that the Rebbe did, when the Rebbe blinked, when the Rebbe, you know, leaned forward, leaned back, the angle that the Rebbe looked at, where the Rebbe was looking at, uh, how long the Rebbe was there for, everything was... Yeah. Do you to the greatest yeah, you knew the Rebbe was completely in control. Even when people would write, people were writing to the Rebbe. Look at the answers we were getting. You know, Rabbi right. Groner would read it, and there was and no everyone question. took the Rebbe's word. Nobody had any doubts about the, uh, you know, zero doubt. It's it's so refreshing to hear this perspective because uh, I would say a vast majority of Chabad Hasidim today don't, if they can help it, ever look at any of these videos from Tafshin and Gimel um, mm-hmm. because, because they say that they don't want to see the Rebbe that way, which oh, I, I hear that. <laughs> but uh, if people understand, what, what people, I guess these people don't see in the video, which, which some people do, you know, and what you're describing was definitely the feeling of the people there, the the love of the Rebbe, the way that if any people say, you know, it's, it's uh, the phrase, uh, that you should see the king in his glory, which some people say, you know, this isn't the way that Rebbe looked in his glory, but in a certain sense, he was the most like a king then. He was he was the king oh, yeah. on his balcony in front of all of his subjects, and oh, everyone yeah. singing Yechi, everyone singing Long Live the King. Maybe the Rebbe wasn't healthy, but but in uh, people didn't care about that because it was clear that the Rebbe was taking us out of God's, and this is some weird spiritual hiccup, and and we all they all love their king and they're all waiting for him to take them out of Gullus and it was palpable and if you know you kind of see that you see the fervor like you were saying before the the cultish uh fervor oh. of the of Sidim then and this you know we're, we have these videos so you try you to try to picture it and to care about it and see you know this this is happening so that's really a different perspective on these uh these videos Oh, yeah. I'll just say one thing about that. You know, when I first was starting to go to 770, I wasn't wearing a kapata and I still had a trim beard. And so when I walked in, it was clear to the Hasidim that I wasn't, you know, I wasn't fully Lubavitch or Lubavitch at all, you know. And so I remember, I remember like it was yesterday, uh, one of the Hasidim, I was standing next to one of the Hasidim and we're singing Yechi and I'm singing Yechi with them. And and he looks at me and he says, um, he said, he looked at me and he just, the, the only thing he said to me was, he says, don't worry about not being here sooner. You've come at the best time. Who said this? Robert Eisenberg. Oh. He, he's come at the best wow. time. And that really touched me because I was like, I, I didn't I didn't I didn't know. I mean, there was so much obviously the whole history from 1950 to 19, you know, all the good stuff in my mind, I missed. You know, and so it was there was some sadness. And he's just looked at me. He didn't he didn't talk to me about it. He didn't, it wasn't like I even shared that feeling with him. He must have just known how I was feeling from the way I was singing and the way I looked. He says, don't worry about missing anything in the past. You've come at the perfect, the best time. I heard, uh, I heard just from my, from my father, it must have been yesterday, a couple of days ago, how, you know, my generation, me and uh, my brother-in-law, we, we look at people like him, like, oh, you guys were there in the good days. You know, what was he there for? And he was born in the Lamids, he was there in the Mems and the Nuns. Um, and he wasn't even Lubavitch, so, you know, at the beginning, so he was there mainly later, and then and the nuns, it's like, oh, you, you were there in the good days, he says, but from his perspective, you know, he was missing the good days from the Chafs, and then, and, 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 and the Yuds, whenever it was all a big family over there with all the, with Rebbe and all the Bakr, but like you're saying, the truth of the matter is that, um, yeah, that's, that's the best time, we're, we're so much closer to the Gula now, and being by the Rebbe then, that that was, uh, that was the climax, and we, we look back. You know, what would it be like to be like by the Shemta for by the Alter Rebbe? It's like we've got it. You know. Yeah. Yeah. We're still in it. I'm saying this is the best time. Well, we can't well, see the Rebbe, but uh, good times are coming. In Chicago, we had this years later. Fast forward many, many years later, my wife and I hosted a Bachrum program here in Chicago, where we brought a bunch of Satim here to Chicago, um, probably around 2002. Um, 2004, I believe it started. You guys may know Yol Kaplan. I don't know if he was a shliach in India, and some of the other Svatim that are Melech Taylor and all these guys. They came here and they lived here in, in in Chicago with us. But in any case, from their perspective, interestingly enough, there's a whole Torah Sachasidus of how actually their time is the best time, 
and it, it's kind of like um, you know how the Rebbe Sicha uh, of, of how the moon in its in its full glory is not as is not as it's furthest away from the sun, but when it's as, yeah. yeah. It's very, the darkest. It's the nearest, yeah. uh, it's dark. So they, but, now they've taken yeah. the new mantle and they say, okay, no, no, this is the time because we're actually, when the Rebbe is not revealed, this is actually the time. Like we're beyond his galas. We're beyond Gilui and we're like, you know. It's yeah, like, that's <laughs> yeah, no, that's there is definitely something to, uh, we have to build up and cultivate our relationships now, which makes them more meaningful. And like you have more etzim, more of the essence like uh, in Las Gilui. But the Rebbe also taught us that uh, the Rebbe says that uh, it's actually a Gimel Thomas mimer. There's only there's two mimerim for Gimel Thomas, and one of them is called Asam Narshenu Bachayim. And in that mimer, the Rebbe explores the whole idea of Kairach, that he was a bit of ahead of his time, and he wanted, he says, well, if darkness is really, like you're saying, if Etzim, if the darkness is really better than Red Revelation, because it has the essence, then let's just go straight to that. And uh, the Rebbe explains what he was missing is that there will come a time with the Gula that the darkness will shine. We'll see how that too is a revelation of Hashem. But the way during Gullus we reveal that, the work we need to do to make that happen is to actively desire revelation. And that kind of reveals, because we're in the darkness, and we're want, desiring the light, and that reveals the... That makes that in the future, yeah. lots of love when Mashiach will come, we'll have the darkness shine. So it's kind of both. We have to know that we are living, that we have the essence now, we have the Rebbe, and yet we obviously still desire to see the Rebbe and want to, uh, we're not complacent with our current situation in, uh, in Gullah. Yeah, so you, ha- ha- you got to work these two, uh, <laughs> two things that's, together. That's Everything's a contradiction. <laughs> yeah. So we're talking a lot about about Yichi and seeing and seeing the Rebbe encourage it and all these things. And I I want to ask you, Miriam, what when's the first time that you heard this phrase and and how was the what was the reaction? What was what was the conversation with Rabbi Majeski around this phrase? And I guess right. how it took off and all that. Um, I you know I was close to Shifra Khan Hendry. I was working for her. Um, and so she was one uh, part of the, you know, the the women's organization who were bringing the jewelry to the Rebbe and talking about receiving, you know, the Rebbe as Mashiach. So I was really in it, you know. Um, but I don't, I don't remember the first time hearing it. But again, again, it was like it's all part of the same package. Where we we want this revelation in the world because there's gonna, it's gonna stop suffering. It's just gonna be no. No more anti-Semitism, no more suffering, only good things for everyone and the revelation of what we're here for. And so if that was part of it, saying that, the you know, to receive the light of Messiah, OK, so let's I'm doing it as I'm on board and, you know, that whole kingship and royalty thing. And so it was just being taught in the school. It was it was at the dorm. It was just everywhere. It was just there was not a question. Everybody was so, doing uh, and saying the same thing. Even when I would go to Muncie, everybody was just all on board. So Kabbalah's plan Mashiach Kainu meant like receiving the face of Mashiach. That meant receiving the Abbas Mashiach. That was the understanding. No question. Of course. Of course. There wasn't anybody else. <laughs> no, Nobody no. else had the position. Why bother saying it if you're not talking about <laughs> no, it? There's a, there's a prevalent, uh, I would say, I'm I'm assuming I guess uh, most Shluchim hold that because they don't focus on this, but that it refers more to the idea of Mashiach or or Gula at large, and we have to cuck more in that. But uh, people shy away or are frightened of of fully embracing the idea that it literally means exactly what it sounds like in its most simple sense to go greet Mashiach. You know. Yeah, I, I personally, you know, just just to vent just for a second, uh, I I personally respect Shluchim more who say. You know, whatever the Rebbe said back then was a hundred percent true, and for whatever reason, I fell off the bandwagon more than people who try to revise the words of the Rebbe to mean something which they clearly did not at the time. You know, okay, somebody's not into it right now. Fine, so you're not into it right now. Okay, I don't, I don't blame anybody or for they're whatever scared, choices or they're, they're scared. Gonna lose followers, whatever so it is, people are gonna you know, there's people that admit it. There's people that just say, you know, I, I, I that's something that happened to us because. We haven't even talked about this, but, you know, after Gimel Thomas, 
you know, my wife and I felt it was very interesting time for us because here we were in specifically in Muncie surrounded by very given over Hasidim, much more than me ever, you know, to this day, they're still given over to the Reverend more than me. And yet, and they were the ones that convinced us, you know, without a shred of hesitation that the Reb is Mashiach, you know, and then after Gimel Thomas, I hate to say, but there was a big handful of prominent people who not right away, it took a while, but then fell off, fell off, you know, and it was just a very strange experience for my wife and I, because here we are, these two Balchubas just walking around Monty. We're still Mashiach, Mashiach, Mashiach. And, and, then, and, 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 and then like slowly to the, it's like people have fallen out, you know, they're like dying off the side of the road. And like they're, they're the people that, uh, that raised us, you know, yeah. we, I'm not, he, I'm not wearing the beard and kapata. Except for the fact that you told me that that's what I'm supposed to be doing. That's so you know? interesting. And it was just a, such a strange irony. You know, here with these two Balchus barely could, you know, know anything, you know, quoting this, we could barely pull a phrase out of a Sikha here or there. But one thing we knew, which is not only did we know that the Rabbah was Mashiach, but we specifically knew it because all these people had told us. Were, exactly. Not just <laughs> yeah. told us. That, it was their, there was their oxygen, and and they raised us on it. And I respect that. I respect a person like that who I'm still friends with some of these people for sure. Much respect to them, you know. But I respect that much more than people who are trying to now reconstruct what was said and how was said. And the rubber didn't really mean this. And like, are you kidding me? Admit that you're that that you're like a regular person, a good person, and then you just struggling like many people fine you know i got it but to, to rewrite what to rewrite history in that way feels like such a violation of what actually happened wow it's so interesting so, can you talk more about about after gimel tamas and and the feeling and how you ended up with the conclusion that you ended up like who like who did you talk to what was what were the conversations that you had with each other and 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 yourself and well, Rab Majeski always stayed the path, and we were very grateful because he was our Mishpia. He never, never changed, always stayed the path. No matter who fell by the wayside, Rab Majeski always was strong and knew exactly what happened during that time and never changed his anything. So that Hello. was great. But I knew, yeah. <laughs> when we were in, in Muncie, and my husband you know, was saying Yehi and Shol, which was perfectly fine. Uh, Rabbi Bechnin had said it was perfectly fine. And and then one time he came home from Shul and he said, you know, that he had said Yechi and some older, you know, Hasid had come over to him and yelled at him and embarrassed him and everything. I'm like, we're out of here. I don't want to stay here anymore. And this wow. was before Muncie was built up with a lot of Lubavitchers. But so we did leave and we came to Chicago, which was very big, strong, you know, um, Shia place to be. And it happened here too. <laughs> It was like, you know, so that was. We're supposed to be mushbeam, but it's somehow whatever we show up is like, it, <laughs> it goes down. It's like falling apart here too. And it's just like, you know. I think at first it was very, at first I, I can describe kind of like what the transformation, because what happened is that, you know, you had people who really went out on a limb, you know, and, um, especially people who, who who had started off as not Lubavitch, like a lot of Satmar, Satmar Hasidim. Munson yeah. was full of Satmar Hasidim that had become Lubavitch. And, you know, by them, you know, their their personality, their persona, their reputation, how they look in front of others is very, very important. As you can imagine, they dress in a certain way. It's like everything is very, you know, they're not superficial and they're Yiddish kind at all. They're very, very strict about all these things. And it was, it was, they, they were some of the most outspoken Mishachis that we had. And before, before Gimel Before Thomas. Gimel Thomas. And after Gimel Thomas, you know, many of them really struggled with the way that they were being viewed by the outside world. They were embarrassed. Many of them were very and embarrassed. Ashamed. And ashamed. And they, I don't blame, it, I don't, they, I don't blame they anybody. Were, they, you know. they, they said something and... Other people looked at them as like, okay, maybe this could happen, you know, that the Rebbe would get up from the hospital bed, and then it didn't. It was people like it was like a Shek thing of short sorts, sorts that Hashem yeah. did, like this complete like 
what you believe, like when Hashem said to Abraham, like, go check to your son, you know, even though you don't believe. And I've told you that you can't do that to, to people, you know, to kill people and everything like that. Go take your son. And I also told you that I would make from him a whole nation and go do this. And then Abraham goes to do it. And I feel like the Rebbe, like, you know, was shechted himself so that we would find our powers within and, and make this happen, you know, without seeing him. And it was like, originally people would talk about it behind closed doors. So there'd be a lot of like private conversations that people would have consoling each other and dealing with it and, and admitting like behind closed doors that they're moving forward in a different path. You know, it wasn't really said publicly. So things kind of continued the way they were, but then eventually there was just enough passivity. There was just so passive about things and that there was lack of energy. And then that eventually turned to coldness. And then eventually that turned into people just deciding that they were not going to, you know, necessarily wear a, y- a Yechiyamak anymore. They weren't going to say Yechi anymore, or, or they just didn't respond the same way. So it wasn't like, a, no one came that I remember, no one came out like the next day and said anything like, okay, you know, nice try, you know, better luck next time, maybe in another hundred years we'll find. Nobody said anything like that. It was just the death of a thousand cuts, so to speak. And what was interesting for us is that we were, you know, again, we're, we're like these brand new Balchuva. <laughs> we don't, no one's including us in any of these conversations. Just, so we're just walking around like, where did everybody go? Like, where, <laughs> what happened, you know? And uh, Baruch Hashem, you know, we've stayed the same way this stayed whole time. Same, of course. <laughs> Well, I'm wondering what did I guess what what was the what were you told about Gimel Tamas? How did you translate Gimel Tamas to mean to continue doing whatever you were doing? I guess for some people it, it meant like okay, it, like you were saying, there were there were people that felt embarrassed that they were telling everybody that this was it, this was it, and then it didn't happen. So I guess for them, I, I don't know exactly what was going through their mind, but I can assume that it was probably we failed and now we need, like you said, we need, and now we're going to wait another few years. So I'm wondering what was it that was like, no, 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 it's still, it's still going on. What, I guess if you can well, talk to yeah, that. It, the funny thing, you know, again, you, 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 you two probably involved in Kirov and, and, and working with secular people. But my wife and I were laughing about this because we were reading your questions beforehand. And one of the things that we were talking about, which is really, you probably don't think about this until, unless you're about tshuva. You know, to us, the idea that the Rebbe was Mashiach, or the Rebbe is Mashiach, is no, di- no more or less strange than any of the other things that we had been taught about Yiddishkeit. Literally any of it, you know, that, that God Wave a chicken the, over the head. Or... <laughs> God actually <laughs> came down same. and gave the Torah to these Jewish people who were all standing around Mount Sinai. <laughs> the, 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 the Red Sea split, and, you know, was, you know, all these different things that we had, Shavuos and, 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 and Sukkot, and, you know, it all was the same. You know, we didn't have any sense of what was normal Judaism, what was not normal Judaism. It all was all superstitious, all completely out of the box, all fairy tales and make believe. And once we decided that we were going to start taking this on, we don't really have any filters to let us know which message is more extreme than others. So for us, the idea that, okay, so before Gimel Thomas, the Rebbe is this Messiah that we've been waiting for for 2000 years, and he's literally going to take the Jewish people, a confe, whatever, to Eretz Yisrael. <laughs> okay, we just toss that in the bag of things that we now believe. And we know? don't understand. We don't understand. Another you know? thing we don't understand. And so okay. then after Gimel Thomas, so somebody says, okay, well, the Rebbe's still Mashiach, da 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 and we're just still going to continue. There's, nothing's changed. Da, da, da. So, okay. You know, wow. there's no difference. It's all, it, it's all, once you swallow one of the pills, you know, it, they all go down afterwards very easily. Whereas yeah. obviously for people who are, you know, from, from birth people, you know, now that we're older, we see now we're more experienced. We can completely understand the challenges that they had with these ideas, you know, but we were just blessed because we didn't really need a lot of indoctrination. It wasn't like we were going against something, you know, especially Reverend Majeski was always sharing all these. He came out with the safer. I'm sure it's still published with all these Mara Makaimas about how Mashiach has to go to a hidden period of time and then he's going to reveal himself again and all these different things that, you know, really weren't talked about for, no one talked about them before Gimel Thomas. 
all that stuff about Mashiach hiding himself and coming back and all that stuff really wasn't, maybe people talked about it a little bit because of the stroke, but besides for that, it really, to the extent that, you know, um, it really wasn't talked about that much that I remember. And, uh, no, it and wasn't so, talked about at all. Yeah, a little bit. People talk about the stroke as being like that oh, time that period. Hiddenness. Yeah, oh, like that, the, right. hiddenness yeah, the that stroke, hiddenness. To explain you know, it, to explain that. Right. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. That's a hit, so, that hiddenness. Okay, so this was a, a more this extreme hiddenness. Yeah, this is a continuation. <laughs> the Rebbe really took it to the next level. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so we didn't really need much, you know. We saw what we saw. I learned what I learned. I knew the people who told me were Er Yidin, and they still are, of course, Er Yidin. And there was a conviction that was made, seared like a, like a, you know, when you brand a cow, yeah, it, yeah a branding. And that was it. We're done. We didn't, we, we, you know, we had a few years where we were, where my, my wife and I, we, it's not that we, we just kind of fell off the wagon a little bit just because of our surroundings. Were, With what? With Mashiach, it took like a little while. We, we took a little break a little bit just because we weren't in a good sviva. But the second we surrounded ourselves with Mishikh like Rabbi Turin here in Chicago and other Mishikhs here in Chicago and or when the Tzvatis came the Tzvatis in, came, you know, it was like back to and, and also like the sources too like when we came to Chicago like I was saying Yehi and believing Yehi but I thought the Rebbe was just gonna you know that Mashiach can die not get killed but Mashiach can die and then come back so I thought you know the Rebbe had died and then was gonna come back like that was fine for me but then when I spoke to some women here very, you know, who could really learn and knew the, you know, everything. They said, no, the Rebbe is still leading us. We need a Nasi. We need a leader. The Rebbe, that hasn't changed. You just can't see him. Okay. Terrific. Even better. Wow. Even better. Writing to the letters, Lord, the Igris and everything. Again, it's not that hard. Once you accept that this is the truth and you didn't understand it anyway, and you're waving chickens over your head or, you know, not turning the lights on and off on Shabbos. Once you believe, you believe. That's it. It's very interesting because I I have conversations with with a few of my relatives and and they're shluchim and they 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 talk about this point they talk they they I'm saying how we have to tell everybody about that that the Rebbe came that the Rebbe came, uh, it was revealed as Mashiach and the Rebbe is Mashiach and the Rebbe is talking about how we're all how the Geula is in the world and all these things and they're like. What do you expect? You want me to go over to, to to some random person and talk to them about the King Messiah and accepting him? I'm like, listen, you're going over to them and you're telling them about Tulin. It's the it's the same yeah. craziness. And like it, you're it, saying it, you're saying you, you experience this, and right. and it's like interesting because you're you're unpacking it more. But this is what I tell them: is yeah, the same thing that you sound nuts when you tell them about tefillin and lighting Shabbos candles. Like what, what's Shabbos candles? You wave your hands, you cover your eyes, you say a blessing and all of a sudden it's a new day. Like it's a different, like yeah. it's, it's very interesting that, that, that was the, I guess what kept you going. Then. Yeah. You see the my love about true. Like you, you obviously you see, you know, the, the my love about true over at Tzadik, but I'm not saying that we have this smile, but I'm saying you, you're working with Bali Chu, but you see that it's like, they're just fresh. They're just fresh and they don't, the, the resistance isn't there. And, and I'm so hopeful. I'm so hopeful personally that, that we, that we recognize that by the secular amongst us as well, what we call secular today, that it's, we have to open up our eyes and realize that, that, that the resistance really isn't there, you know, and, and, and you know, it's just something that we're struggling with more than what they're struggling with. Yeah, but I, I remember when I was in, when I was learning in Israel, and it wasn't a Lubavitch place or anything like that, but I remember, like, I again, I had come to rescue him. I was in the Israelite program, and I was writing on Shabbos. I was up on my bunk bed. I was writing on Shabbos, you know, because, again, I didn't believe anything. I was just there to learn to get him out. What do I need to learn? And I'll get him out, and then to, he'll, he'll go back to the States, and he'll become normal again. So that's what I was there. But, you know, it was kind of interesting to learn about, to fill in and learn about Okay, I'll look at it as kind of like a subject in school. Teach me this interesting stuff that I never heard of before about Judaism, you know, orthodoxy. So, but I remember I was writing letters on Shabbos and, and, and at some point it was kind of like, it's just a choice. It's just a decision. You decide there's something spiritual that you don't understand at all and that you can't see and that you probably can't even feel, but you're just going to decide that if God gave the Torah, and and Jews are supposed to keep Shabbos, then you don't turn the lights on and off and you don't write. And then you are part of that spirituality and you're doing something very positive in the world that you can't see and you might not even feel. 
but you do it because you made that decision that this comes from God and this is what God wants you to do. And that's what it is. And it's like the same thing with, with Mashiach and Messiah. And that and decision like, itself creates it's that the Shabbos. decision. That's, that's one of the things you always talk about. How that decision itself created the Shabbos. Meaning what's the difference between somebody who keeps Shabbos and somebody who doesn't? Somebody who keeps Shabbos in, in many ways create Shabbos by keeping Shabbos. Meaning, if you if you didn't if if, you, if somebody fell off the time machine, didn't know what day of the week it was, they wouldn't necessarily the way Hashem created the world, they wouldn't necessarily know that this day. This is the thing they can smell that it's Shabbos, okay? But besides for that, none of us would normally know. But we we create that spiritual reality, and I think that's a big part of what the Rebbe is talking about in terms of opening up our eyes, right? And that, and I know this is one of your questions. It's like we create the Mashiach reality by the way we perceive the world, and this was such a kacha the Rebbe. This is such a message that the Rebbe gave us that we have it within us to bring down the Shekhinah and to reveal the the Atzmas and the and the whole plan merely by us choosing to see it and relate to the world in that fashion. And decide that they're ready. In the same way that we keep Shabbos. In the same way that, if, like Mara said, it's a choice. You know, wow. if you write on Shabbos, it's, it's not Shabbos. It's, a, it's not Shabbos for you. But, yeah. but the point is, it's like when the Altar Rebbe was in prison, the Altar Rebbe knew what time it was. Because he could see the spirituality and the spirit that were coming in. Okay, so I don't feel that. I don't see it. But but there are people that do. And so they're my guiding light, you know. And then I just, and, and it's like that decision that this is true. The spirituality is true. And I don't see it. And, you know, that's just, that's just the way it is. And it's like the Rebbe also said about, you know, tell, tell the world that Israel belongs to us because God gave it to us. And we can't give you know, gifts away that, that Hashem gave us, that God gave us. That's all you have to say. You don't have to get into arguments, this and that. They, this is what they want to hear, and this is the truth. And so who am I to say about the arguments, the this and that? Don't, don't bother. Just say what the Torah says. Mm -hmm. It's and interesting it. how it, all of Obavitch is, so to speak, on board still that we should spread the message that the Rebbe is still the Nasi Adar which if you learn the Rebbe Sikhas kind of also means like you're mentioning that he's alive in some fashion, but for some reason they feel awkward spreading the message that he's therefore still Mashiach, which the Rebbe very clearly linked together that the Nasi Adar is the Mashiach Shabbat Dar. So if we're still in Dar Shvi and the Rebbe still the Nasi, we're, he's also still Mashiach, which means that all of this mm -hmm. fervor and Mashiach, Kabbalah, Mashiach, Yechi stuff that was going on in Beis, Nagimel, Nandalit, is no less relevant today by everyone else's own standards. But yet it's they, everyone's projecting their own insecurities and assuming yeah. that everyone else will uh, feel the same way. And it's good to hear you guys say it from the other side because I know when I've gone like America Slickers and talking to people who totally fry uh, people and to varying degrees of uh, knowledge, but people with not a lot of at least knowledge uh, of anything, and you're selling them the whole story. Hey, there was this Matan Tera, and there's Meshur Abenu, and and there's this, <laughs> every generation there's a Meshur Abenu, and that's what a Rebbe is. And it's like, and he's Mashiach. Well, obviously, you know it. <laughs> that, <laughs> you know, okay. Uh, and he's if the Rebbe, every generation he's our leader, and he's he's gonna take a. a it's uh, of all messages, the Rebbe's a pretty good Mashiach. I don't know, it's pretty. <laughs> He's a Amazing. nice guy. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's yeah. so, uh, th that's at least, uh, you know, I've never met somebody who didn't already have knowledge on the subject and an opinion who I was telling to him. So hold it, hold it, hold it. No, no, no. You, you crossed the line. That's too far. There's no way. Ain't no way. That's, uh, so it's Unless gratifying. they're from already. If they're Unless from, they they have already. knowledge already. They have a preconceived notion. But somebody <laughs> who's starting off without, uh, no, I mean the Christians stole it from us. It's it's the other way. It's the other way around. Yeah, and that that is an interesting nakuda. Also, like it, you two obviously you you grew up in Chabad. Um, my wife and I, you know, obviously didn't. So, it it if you talk about a shliach that's out in the middle of the wilderness or something, I, I'm assuming mental lavavachers are uncomfortable with that particular nakuda. You know that that particular point. Um, and I know it coming from a Shatora and coming from the Litvish world, that was that was definitely something that was, you know, uh, told to me, you know, it was one of the downsides of Lavavich was that, they, you know, they're they, they're sounding like, you know, 
the non-Jews lahaptil with you know? with the Messiah. Right. Yeah, yeah. With, yeah. Right. but it's all Absolutely. ignorance. It's just not knowing. Right. It's just not knowing. It's just ignorance. You know. And then it's the arrogance that comes along with it that we know more than you. Like I, I was watching on Zeb Brenner. You know, Rabbi Rubin was there, and um, you know some of the questions coming in. And I, I really felt like writing an article for the Jewish press. It's like, why the Kenegid? Why are they against? You know, wh- why the quit? Like, why the excitement about being against? Like, come on! Like, do you have a better Mashiach? Do you have a better Messiah? We got to get out of this mess that we're in. And who's going to do it? And the Rebbe's fits the bill. And then again, look at the sources or learn from someone who knows the sources so well, and open up your mind to that possibility without having to have an agenda against it's the eight Sahara, you know, still being there for people, I guess. Right. There's the, the story from, from the Mashiach Suda that the Rebbe was saying <clears throat> about the Mashiach dance, about the d- Mashiach dance. And the Rebbe said that there's two explanations to the Mashiach dance. One of them is dancing uh, to prepare ourselves for Mashiach or, or, you know, it's the Mashiach energy. So we're dancing for Mashiach, whatever. And then there's Mashiach dancing with Mashiach, Mashiach dance, dancing with Mashiach. And the Rebbe said, wouldn't it be so much better to explain it as the, as we're dancing with Mashiach? And then he stood up and started dancing with everybody. Wow. But it, it, it's it's that feeling of like, you have two options. You have an option of 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 being really down and, and uh, it, Gullis is so hard and, and Mashiach seems like such a far off dream and of, of, a, of a utopia and this and that and the other. Or on the other hand, you can be like, no, let's try to find out if Mashiach is coming now, right? Like after October 7th, there was a few people that were posting and it went viral about the Yalkut Shemaini that the Shana Shemal HaMashiach by that the year that that Mashiach is going to be revealed, uh, the, the, it says that the kings are going to be fighting with each other and then Hashem is going to tell the Jews, don't worry, um, you, you know, you guys are my my my, spe- my special ones. All these things, it, it's so much more exciting. It's so much better. It's so much nicer. It feels so much better when 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 it's happening now or you're telling me that it already happened and we're in the process already. It I, Yeah, like you're saying, I don't understand why why you're so against it. What? Why? What? Right. Yeah, yeah. We're like, what do you have? And it's so funny that Yalkut Shimoni was from the Gulf War. Right. That's where it was right. quoted in Lubavitch. I mean, that's we lived that. I mean, that. Was, said it was so then, yeah. I see, when I see you know Litfish people saying that today, I'm just like, wait, you missed the boat. It already happened. <laughs> yeah, never. And the Rebbe was revealed, and it happened back in because the Rebbe said, hang up that the rest of the Yalkut Shimoni and show someone the was hanging that, it up. Shalom Shalom Bar. I mean, the guy by the Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but it was that was that like a long time ago. I think this also ties into uh, the story with Mashiach Tan ties into what you were saying about opening a rise that it's kind of up to us to dictate the reality. The Rebbe says that it's there. Rebbe said, if it's up to us, let's choose what's learned by uns better, what comes out better for us, what's more geschmack. Rebbe said, if yeah. it's up to us, let's choose the better one. It's just kind of what you're saying that it is up to us and and let's open up our eyes and, and choose the one where Mashiach's actually here. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to, you know, share that because that was one of your questions. You know, one of the one of the, when I was in Asia tour a long time ago, they one of the ways that they would convince you, so to speak, to if you were had, had Sveikas, which everybody did, they would say to you, they said, "Listen, you know, you're going to live to 120. You know, let's just say you adopt this lifestyle. If you adopt this lifestyle, you get all the benefits, this and that. You get all the pluses. You know, what's the minus? Okay, so you can't ride your we can't ride your car on Shabbos, but the pluses, if you do it. These are all the incredible pluses. So you don't even need to think about it so much. Just make a little calculation. Uh, I believe. Yeah. 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 And then, but, and, and I like to say the same thing. One of your questions was, you know, how do you feel about it now today? And would you have done anything different? I believe that was one of your questions. And that's basically the same answer that I have. You know, you have one life as a Jew to live here and this goof that you've been given with this neshama, this whole thing. Why not spend it? you know, living on the edge of your seat, waiting, you know, anticipating and participating, anticipating and participating in the Geula. I am so happy about the choice that the way Hashem has helped me, you know, exist during this life 
believing and anticipating and getting excited about and looking at the world through this perspective and having the friends that I have and the community that I have and the highest of, of being a mishichist and, and living in, in, in this geula life. You, we only have one time to, to do it. You know, it, it's such a plus, you know, and you, you can't, you're not going to, at the end of, at the end of, at the end of somebody's life, Hashem's never going to hold that against you. You know, it, it's, it's, it's a choice that we have to, Look at the Rebbe this way and live our life in this way and and raise your children with this positivity and sing and dance with with the Rebbe as Mashiach. Why not? You know, it, it's the best for me. It's been such a such a blessing, you know, in my life. And, and, and I know for my wife as well. So I guess in a, in a word, in a in a short, the answer to the question is nothing's changed. And we're all going <laughs> Nothing's yeah. changed, but but it hasn't happened fast enough. All right, so I want to ask you, I guess, being with, with having this whole, um, I guess, worldview, how does it affect your what the, the life that you've lived from from I guess 1994 until now? How how does that affect the way the way you raise your children, the way you do your your coaching and all and all that different things, if yeah, so um, me coming out with my book was very interesting because I, I when I got the idea that I'm going to write this book and tell like this like romantic love story through the Rebbe, like which was really the Rebbe story through me, you know, for the the concept of getting Gula out there and we're going to a better place. Uh, the world is changing for the better somehow, and you know the Rebbe is you know Mashiach. So I knew that that it was a, it was interesting for me because here I was a coach and I coach people who are not Jewish, people who are secular Jewish people, um, they're Litvish, they're Chabad, whatever. And I knew I'm like coming out of the closet here. I'm telling I'm everybody, I'm like a religious, you know, Jewish woman. And this is what I believe. And so I was like kind of shechting myself, you know, just going like, um, but I'm doing this because why? Because I want Mashiach and I want Ka'ula and I haven't let go of that dream. And so um, I just wrote a second book and it's about somatic healing. So it's a little different than my first book, very different than my first book, but it's all about somatic healing. And how the Rebbe says that, uh, you know, the, that it, in the times of Gullis, that the, the soul gives life to the body, but in the times of Mashiach and, and Geula, the body will give life to the soul. And we see that through all these healing modalities that are coming out. So I bring it into, so if I'm, if I'm coaching someone who's, you know, not Jewish or, you know, you know, secular or just different observancies, like, you know, I might bring in some Kabbalah, some mysticism, but otherwise it's like, we're all on this healing journey to see, you know, the bigger picture that's going on in our lives, the bigger picture in our marriages, the bigger picture with our children. And so it just, it infuses everything for me. It infuses everything. Amazing. It's, it's, it, no, it's, it's very interesting that you're saying about the somatic healing that, yeah, it, it, there's so many things. And, and I, and I was, I made a, um, for Adolf Nissen, I, I was trying to compile a list of, of, you know, people are trying, I'm, I'm with the advent of this podcast, I'm talking to a lot of people and they're trying to ask me of what, how do, how do I do things? Like people like to get down to business. Like, what should I do? What do you want me to do different? And all these things. So I decided to put a list together of what you, what I think you should do in order to, to get more into Mashiach mindset, Mashiach energy and all these things. So one of the things was that after you, yeah, I said, that you should accept Rebbe as Melech and all these different things. And a part that will change your physical life is that once a week or once a month to find something in the world that you see is different because the fact that Mashiach and the Geula is already in the world, right? The Rebbe said uh, in, in Mishpatim that that um, we see already the beginning of the effect of Mashiach in the world. So obviously, if that ha if that was if the Rebbe said that 32 years ago, everything that has been happening until then has been the effect of Mashiach. So the question is. What, what do you, what, now that we're, now that we're trying to become more Mashiach um, consciousness, what do you see in the world that is, that is showing that? And so that, that's interesting that, yeah, you're, you're, you're basically saying how this is your life and you see the 
effect of Mashiach in the world that that we're working on 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 healing of, of the body. Yeah. It's very healing interesting. Of the, body, the healing of the trauma, the whole, um, you know, the, even the way we do our marriage coaching and my husband comes out, he brings Jewish concepts, you know, on Twitter. He's got an audience of like 40,000, you know, who are mostly not Jewish, who are eating up the truth of like relationships and this steady way of looking at men and women and you know, and so it's kind of like the Torah being like this, the saving grace and this steady light on our journey and, um, and bringing that to people and they love it. They love it. They want, they want that higher vibration for themselves and their marriages and their families. So yeah. And the healing too. So I, I want to ask you one, one more question. I guess what can, I, I, this is a question for both of you. What do you think if some, someone would ask you, how can, I, how can I bring this into my life and what should I be doing different? Okay, well, you know, at the risk of sounding re re repetitious, you know, to me, the first step is always the learning, you know, to learn about Indiana Mashiach and Gula. It's the same thing with anything in life. If you don't know where you're headed, you're never going to get there. Right? So <laughs> the first thing is to figure out where you're going. You know, for many people, these ideas of Mashiach, whether it's, you know, opening up your eyes through the gula or bringing the Aleph into Gola, you know, and, and you know, some of the more basic concepts that we have, um, what is the role of Mashiach in the world? You know, simple things, you know, base of leadership above all, some of these basic ideas of what Mashiach is going to do to the world, bring to the world, you know, Kaifif is called, you know, Kola Olam, you know, is going to, you know, encourage the entire world even stronger to keep Torah compel. And, and compel. Thank you, thank you. Compel. Um, you know, what is what is Mashiach bringing the world? What's what is what is the Hasidus behind Mashiach? You know, what's the deeper what's the deeper kavana of the Shechina coming into this world? And how do we until we understand these concepts? It's hard to see it in the world. So it's just like it's just like it says in the in in, in the Gemara Kedushin that. You know, we learn so that we can do. Right? What's greater, somebody a talmud chacham or a chassid? You know, and so we we you know we learn in order to do, and it's the same thing here. We're learning in the Mashiach and Gula in order for us to become a Mashiach Yid. And what is a Mashiach Yid? A Mashiach Yid is somebody whose eyes have now been trained, like you were mentioning earlier, to see once a week. I like to, you know, I, I would love to do not not once a month, not once a week, every day. There's so many opportunities every day for us to look at anything. And I'm on Twitter a lot and I'm on all the other things. And I see literally every day. I, if It's a funny thing because I do the Hayom Yom every day in Shul and then I make up my own in Yana Mashiach and Gula afterwards. And people always laugh because I just say the craziest things back to the making Kedushim like I was like a Litvak, right? <laughs> and so <laughs> I come up with these crazy things. But it, when we train ourselves to see the world differently through the Rebbe's eyes, it's been 40 years. So through the Rebbe's eyes, we have this chus, we have the ability to train ourselves to see the world through Geula eyes. It's such a privilege for us, you know, and the world is waiting, as wacky as some of our ideas sound, you know. So, we, you know, both, you know, whether it's the what's happening with the encampments in in the universities or whether it's, you know, even October 7th or, you know, the, like my wife was mentioning about Eretz Yisrael and talking about what the Rebbe said back in the in the UN, all the different things that we can bring to the world just for ourselves. And it strengthens your kids and strengthens your family. And there's a, there's an edge of positivity there that we have access to uh, and, and inspiration that we have access to. So yeah, it begins with the learning, then it's training yourself through the learning to see the world in a different perspective. And when we have that, we there's a light about a person. There's a, a positivity. There's a, a, a inspiration for that person that is infectious. And there's a pride, too. We're so prideful. I go out on Twitter and I literally bring in Yanni Mashiach and Gula onto Twitter, you know, every day. And Twitter is not necessarily the most hospitable place. Uh, it doesn't normally <laughs> Twitter. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> You know, and, and, you know, see Rob Manus Friedman, Manus, Rabbi Manus Friedman is talking about Mashiach literally on YouTube. He's got half a million followers. Unbelievable. You look at the comment section, you ever want to get inspired, take a look at the comment section on some of his videos. It's insane. A total non-Jews thanking him from top to bottom, admitting that he's always right, that the Jewish nations are the blessed people and that, you know, we carry the torch of light in the entire world. It's, it's, it's amazing what's actually happening. Yeah. And I think, I think the learning is 
that's crucial for sure that people can do every day and start and learn and learn and learn, learn with the right people who aren't distorting the sikhas or anything. But I think also working within, like that's why the somatic healing or the relationship work that we do is that, you know, even on a tiny level, you really need to come to Gaula within yourself. So, um, you know, the arrogance or the, um, the judgment of other people yeah. or the fear or the jealousy, whatever it is, we've got our things that we do that are not kosher, you know, so we've got to also reach that Gaula point within too, um, and keep strengthening our faith and, and keep healing from the inside out. If there's trauma wounding or whatever it is, like keep healing. There's so many modalities and, and that's the work that I get to do with women. And it's fantastic. You know, it's just fantastic. And so that's, that's, you know, that's something. And then, you know, you said something about the Armon, the palace. And so for me, it's like, I, I used to have a picture up, you know, um, and uh, by my desk with the Armon, because this is the, the palace that had been spoken about many years ago. I love the picture. It was like, oh my gosh, that's the coolest thing. Like a Mashiach palace, like, woo, you know? So it was just part of the package for me. I loved it. And then I must have taken the picture down. I don't remember why, but what was interesting was that there was someone, someone was doing after October 7th, there was someone was doing like a meditation. His name is Rev. Daniel Katz. Katz. And so I was listening to him and he was doing like a meditation and uh, it was very beautiful. And I saw like in my imagination, like I saw, like I always wondered, how is it going to be like when Mashiach comes, like the Rev is going to walk into 770 and do this with his arm and everything's like changes. Like, what is this going to look like? And of course, I don't, you know, I can never know. I have those answers, but, but it was interesting because then when, when I was like, just, you know, part of this meditation and just listening and whatever, um, then I just saw like in my imagination, like the Rebbe actually in Eretz Yisrael with the crown, with the robe, with the scepter, like dressed as a monarch, as a king. And I'm like, oh, that makes sense. Like, why would the Rebbe come in the Kapata in 770 when really she is supposed to really arrive in you know, Eretz Yisrael. So, and then I saw like that, like, but, and then it was kind of like the Rebbe was going amongst the hostages and this was before any were released, but like kind of just, you know, with the scepter, like releasing some, and then thank God some really did just, you know, walk out, especially the ones from like Chicago and Evanston, there were two, two women who actually did, but it was interesting because there was this feeling and this sense for me is like, oh, the Rebbe doesn't have a place in Eretz Yisrael. The Rebbe doesn't have a makom. Oh, and then I thought like, oh yeah, what about the Armon? What about the palace? There, there was supposed to be a place for the Rebbe to be, to come to. Mashiach is supposed to come to. And then also just a feeling of like the Rebbe's presence being over all of Eretz Yisrael. But it was very interesting because then a few days later I was talking with somebody. I was at a Tehillim group or something. I was talking with someone. I told them this, this is what I saw. Like I always thought the Rebbe was supposed to come into 770 with the kapata and the, the hand movement. And then, but then I saw this, image of the Rebbe actually being in Eretz Israel as a king with the crown and the different, the robes. And then she said, oh, there's a whole Armon group going on, you know, people talking about the palace. And, and it was like, wow, that's so, that's so important because Mashiach needs a place. The Rebbe needs a place in Eretz Israel. So like, and you, when you build it, they'll come, you know, and when we build it, Mashiach will come. Why not? And because it, it did feel like a lost sense when I had that image in mind of this, like, wow, the Rebbe's, where's the place for the Rebbe? Where's the Makom for the Rebbe, you know, and Mashiach. So I don't know. And then like, re, you know, Rabbi Reuven's involved in it. And it's just like, yes, we need to do this. We need to make this happen. And, and again, what's stopping it? Fear or politics or narishkeit foolishness that's very human but enough already enough we can't afford it we need the tunnel yeah. diggers to get... <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's yeah, uh, uh, <laughs> mentioned before so there there the rabbi says that the base of mikdash is first going to become be revealed by 770 and then from there we'll go to um i guess at least hashem will first be revealed in 770 with the base mikdash and then go to Eretz Yisrael, but it's all going to Eretz Yisrael. Yeah, but they never wanted to have a a palace for Mashiach in Eretz Yisrael proper. And the other story, and, I thought maybe, maybe Mashiach was already revealed in seven seventy, and you know, and, and and so now the other place is important. Now we got to have a, a oh. place that can be revealed in in Eretz Yisrael. <laughs> the the other story is somebody 
Tachem, or some people were discussing outside of the Rebbe's room, what will it be like uh, when Mashiach comes? Like, how is it going to happen? With and then the Rebbe walked out the door, and and it was like they were they were shocked. It was sudden, and the Rebbe said exactly like that. Like you know, this person, like and the idea is that like this person will be doing this or that, and and, and, and boom. Exactly like that. Yeah. And that can happen. Yep. Wow. That's very exciting. And to just live with that image and that vision and everything, you know, and, and it is to have like a, it is to have like it in our mind as like kind of a vision. It's very interesting because the Rebbe said when he said, even before I was three, before I was in Cheder, I would imagine what the world would be like when Mashiach comes. And, you know, that's where everything starts. It starts in our imagination. So we can we can envision, and that might be something for people to do every day, envision Mashiach, Geula, the Rebbe coming, whether it's in 770, the Ramon, whatever it is, like like that, like this. Yeah. Just like that. And, and that would be a way of bringing... getting involved in building the Ramon that actually helps to make all these imaginings concrete. Like, oh, like you were saying, yes, you, you get involved in real a real king in a real place with, with a palace, yes. not some fantasy, like yeah. uh, some people like to say, the MBD Mashiach, you know, like the Melech Mashiach will descend, like, where is it coming yeah. from? <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. But it starts in the imagination and then we bring it into form, into the world. So that's something. And even they say in the coaching worlds and everything, like when you, when you, um, kind of want something or desire something to happen or a healing for someone or whatever, like imagine in your imagination them getting them getting out of the sick bed or whatever. Like see it. It's a very powerful tool, the imagination. Yeah. Is there anything that you wanna any last words that you want to give to to the audience? Any message that you haven't shared yet? <laughs> <laughs> Don't be afraid. Yeah, like what Rabbi Rubin said that as when he came out and he said Yehi and he said what he says about the Rebbe, he says it wasn't as scary as I thought, you know. And we all need to break through that fear, all of us in all parts of our lives, but especially in this part. Wow. Okay. Thank you so much. This was a pleasure. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Looking forward to watching more of your podcasts for sure. <laughs> and thank you for doing this and, and uh, encouraging people who, you know, are living during a different time and experiencing something, you know, in your age and, and making it like really real for people. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, It's amazing that the younger generation is taking this and running with it. You know, it's something that was always a question when we were younger, whether what's going to be, what's going to be, but it's so beautiful to watch the youth today so many of them embrace this whole pathway and this whole message. It's terrific. So yeah. Yash thank Kaya, you. you. Thank too. you for leading that and not being afraid. Of course, and thank you for coming on. I really, we, we really appreciate it. And I'm sure everybody will benefit from it. And um, of course, if you're watching this, uh, you should obviously share this with other people, um, share the message of Mashiach, comment, join the conversation and let us know what you think. And um, obviously subscribe so that this can reach as many people as possible. And um, I hope everybody has a beautiful week, a beautiful day, a beautiful year. And um, we should uh, we should finish this with the Hizkalos, the full revelation of Mashiach coming in. The palace should already be built. And the hostages released completely, you know, free. And and all course. the years having Yeshua. Right. Yes. We want We want Mashiach, Mashiach now. now. <laughs> the only answer. ועד כדי כך המדב גולהוב מדר עם זול מחי זין ישי המלך.